So shout out to Epson for sending this over for a review. This is their brand new laser projector, which means you get up to 20,000 hours of laser lamp life. Which is something like eight hours a day for like almost a decade. But inside the box, we get a quick setup guide and some documentation. And here we get the batteries, the remote control with backlight, and the power cable. So this looks like it's about roughly the same size as the other Epson projectors that I've had in for review, namely the 6050. It measures 20 and a half inches wide by 17.6 inches in depth by seven and a half inches tall. And it weighs 28 pounds. So let's take a look up front here. Up front, we have the lens behind a motorized door. Kudos to you, Epson, for providing a motorized door. JVC and Sony should take notice of that. So I do like that feature. And the lens is motorized as well. So you don't have to manually adjust it yourself. So that's always good. Up top, we get a couple of indicators. We get a status light indicator, laser indicator, and a temp indicator as well. Around back, we get the controls, the menu button, the lens control button, control pad, back button, and as far as ins and outs, we get a USB in, USB service, trigger out, LAN connection, optical HDMI, two HDMI inputs, which are 2.1 compliant at full 48 gigabits per second. So this will support 4K at 120 Hertz. And there's also an RS-232 input as well. Now the side is the power and source selection button. And flipping it over, there are some adjustable feet. So if you're gonna put this on a shelf, you can adjust that as well right there. And then we do have some mounting points on the bottom. So if you wanna ceiling mount that, it is compatible with that. But specs wise, this is not a native 4K projector. This is an upscaling projector once again. So no native for you guys, not yet. But at this price point, it makes sense. But unlike Epson's previous projectors where it upscaled only to about 4 million pixels, this one will actually pixel map full 4K resolution at 8.29 million pixels. So you will get true 4K resolution with this year's models. Contrast ratio is 1,200,000 to 1 with dynamic contrast enhancement. So that's gonna be pretty cool as well to check that out. This does support HDR10 and HDR10+. So let's go ahead, get this hooked up in the home theater, and we'll come back, give you some thoughts and impressions. I'm gonna have the Epson projecting a 100 inch image on a Stuart film screen Harmony G2 at about 12 feet away. It's an acoustically transparent screen with a gain of 0 0.07. Let's take a quick look at some of these settings. The first option is the frequently used items, which is self-explanatory. Under image, we've got a few presets under color mode. We've got natural, cinema, bright cinema, vivid, and dynamic, which is the brightest. Although I find that natural looks the most natural. Here we've got sliders for brightness, contrast, saturation, tint, and in sharpness. We've got a few different options here for standard, thin line enhancement, or thick line enhancement. If you have calibration tools, we have white balance adjustments between 3200K up to a nice cool 10,000K. Here is the green and magenta correction. On a custom, we've got sliders for RGB and grayscale adjustment. On a frame interpolation, we've got off, low, normal, or high. That's if you want to get the smooth soap opera effect. On a light output, you've got from 100% all the way down to 50%. For the most HDR pop, you're probably going to want to keep this on 100%. For dynamic contrast, this will brighten up or dim down the luminance of the laser depending on your image brightness. We've got high speed, normal, or off. Under image preset mode, you can go in and adjust noise reduction, MPEG noise reduction, super resolution, auto contrast enhancement, or you can reset. For scene adaptive gamma, this will automatically adjust the color tone according to the scene that you're watching on screen. Here is your gamma adjustment. You can either go up plus two or down negative two. Or if you have calibration tools, you can go in and adjust multiple points. Under RGB CMY, we've got sliders for that here. And then last option under image is reset to defaults. 
for signal IO. We've got signal format. You can choose between limited or full or keep it on auto. You've got overscan options, color space. You can choose between auto 709 or 2020. Under dynamic range, you've got either SDR, HDR10 slash HDR10 plus or HLG. This will give you the incoming signal, which is HDR10 right now. And then this is the HDR slider, which we'll check out in a little bit. Under image processing, this sets the response speed for images projected at high speed, such as games. You've got either fine or fast. For HDMI NEQ level, this changes the setting if there is noise in the image or if no image is being input from the HDMI input port. You've got either auto, low, medium, or high. And the last option under signal IO is reset to defaults. The next option is EDID, HDMI link, and then reset signal IO settings. Under installation, we've got the test pattern. Under display pattern, this will help you align the projected image onto your screen or your wall and also check for sharpness and focus. You've got color isolation such as RGB. Under projection, you've got either front, rear, front ceiling or rear ceiling. Here is your horizontal and vertical keystone. So if you cannot get the projector squared evenly with your screen or your wall, you can digitally manipulate the image here to make it fit. Obviously, you do not want to use this if at all possible. So try and get your image squared up as squarely as possible with your screen or your wall, or else you will be digitally manipulating the image and degrading your image performance. Under screen blanking, we've got top, bottom, left and right. High altitude mode on or off that will ramp up the fan. And then you can reset all of the installation settings. Under display, we've got a few options here. We've got no signal screen, startup screen, messages, menu color, standby confirmation. For panel alignment, you can select your color, either R, G, or B. Go in, you can start adjustments, either shifting the whole panel or adjusting the four corners. So if you're seeing a little bit of green, red, or blue kind of peeking out from the white lines, you can go in and adjust that so everything is nice and crisp. You can save that to memory reset what you've just done or you can reset all of the display settings under operation you've got direct power on sleep mode sleep mode timer between one minute up to 30 minutes standby mode communication on or off indicators on the projector either on or off turn on or off the trigger you can invert the direction button which is on the projector and then reset the operation settings under management we've got lens lock child lock control panel lock color uniformity log save destination, either internal memory or a USB, batch setup range, different languages, information status such as the operation hours and the incoming signal format, display status, either system version, network or input signal, and then you can reset the management settings. Under network settings, you've got wired LAN info, network settings, reset your network settings, memory settings for image lens position, or you can reset all of that. You can reset everything in the projector and then you can do a firmware update. And that is it for all of the projector's settings. I'm coming from a Sony 325ES, which is only an 1800 lumen projector. The Epson blows it away for brightness, making it seem dull in comparison. Colors had more vibrancy and HDR material came across more like it was on a giant LED TV. Finding a good balance with the auto contrast enhancement and scene adaptive gamma, along with I think the natural preset, can really make your image pop enhancing depth perception. Now, although it has a scene adaptive gamma feature, it doesn't have scene adaptive or dynamic HDR tone mapping. This is where the manual intervention with the HDR slider takes place. Using the Spears and Munsell disc, you can see that with 600 nit material, I can put the slider down to a 9 before it starts clipping detail in the snow and in the backgrounds. The lower you go, the brighter it gets. With 1000 nit material, the same level 9 is all blown out, so I had to turn it up to an 11 to get a nice balance before clipping. And at 2000 nits, I had to raise it up even more. So you can see the brighter the content, the more you'll have to adjust the HDR slider to find a good balance between brightness and detail. So it doesn't do it automatically like it does on other projectors like a JVC. And speaking of JVC, they're known to have great black levels. Now, this isn't going to be a fair comparison, I know, since the JVC NZ7 costs twice as much as the Epson. But for folks wondering what spending twice the money gets you and if it's worth it, I think this is going to be worth mentioning. Here's a shot in Blade Runner 2049 using the Cloud Escape. The first image is the Epson, which in person does look really good. And the second image is from the JVC. 
I've adjusted the HDR slider in the Epson to match it the best I could without crushing shadow detail. In the side by side I think you can see it's pretty easy how raised the blacks are in comparison to the JVC. I can of course match the blacks of the JVC but then the image becomes too dark and unwatchable. Keep in mind that this isn't a professionally calibrated image on either one so it's all being done with the basic settings. Here's another scene from Blade Runner 2049. In the JVC you can see there's a bit of extra detail behind his head whereas the Epson is all washed out. There's more texture on the headrest and around his ear on the JVC while it's flatter on the Epson. Again, keep in mind that we are talking about a projector that is twice the price of the 11,000. And for those wondering, what does an upscaled 4K image look like compared to a native 4K projected image? Well, if you are close enough, you can make out the pixel structure on the Epson. If you have a look at her eye, I think it's pretty easy to discern. On the JVC, they're non-existent. Now, this is about a foot away from the screen, so it's really pixel peeping. At a normal viewing distance at, say, 6 feet or further away, then it becomes a non-issue and the image is smooth and very crisp. Alright guys, we are doing some Forza 5 on the Xbox Series X on the Epson. And picture quality looks really nice. The challenge with it is matching the lumens with the HDR calibration settings. Very different than a TV. Quality felt a little sluggish on Forza, moving it down to 1080p, and the performance mode is much more um, responsive. Picture quality is nice. It's very, very bright, and it's very, very clean, but there has to be some settings adjustment, as the Epson has a lot of settings that you don't typically see on a display. And once you dial it in, it actually does look very good. But just be prepared to knock down the brightness a little bit. It is very, very bright for a projector. But playing in performance, much more responsive. And keep in mind that playing on a large screen, a lot of the pixel blur you maybe don't see on a panel, you are seeing on a projector screen at 120, 130 inches. But it's very responsive in performance and wasn't bad playing Halo, felt pretty responsive. We don't know what the input lag is exactly, but it's definitely playable. At the time of this video, the Epson LS11000 is selling for $4,000. Now there is a black version for $5,000 that gets you 2700 lumens rather than the 2500, and it's supposed to have a better lens, better black levels, and being more home theater centric, the black housing will blend in better with a darkened room. If you are serious about your home theater experience, the LS12000 will also give you support for an anamorphic lens for that ultra wide view. Another thing missing from the 11,000 projector and also the 12,000 is support for 3D content. There are a lot of Epson users that like the bright output from their earlier models such as the 6050 that have huge 3D collections. And yes, they are still making 3D Blu-rays. So for those loyal Epson fans that want to upgrade, they're going to have to go with a different brand like BenQ or a JVC. That aside, at $4,000, it's obviously not going to compete with a $10,000 JVC. You're going to be looking at DLPs from brands like LG and the BenQ. I personally find DLPs will give you a slightly crisper image, although they do suffer from the rainbow effect, which would push me towards the Epson. I also think the Epson has a more film-like quality over the DLP's more digital look. The 11,000 can throw an incredibly bright image, but keep in mind you will be dialing some of that brightness down if you want to preserve the best highlight and shadow detail. That is the case for just about every projector, whether it's 4 grand or 24 grand. The black levels I think were perfectly acceptable at this price, but if you do want better performance, you're going to have to drop some more spare change. Overall, I think this is a great high performance entryway into home theater projection. If you want that big cinematic experience without having to drop five figures, the Epson LS11000 might be just the projector you're looking for. Now, if you do want to grab one of these Epsons or any projector I've mentioned in this video, you can pick one up with our channel partner Value Electronics. Just give them a ring and let them know that we sent you. So what are your thoughts on these new Epsons? Do you think spending more for Sony or JVC is worth it or is pixel shifting good enough? Leave a comment down below and let us know. As always guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to like the video if you found it useful and if you're not a subscriber, tap the subscribe button and we'll see you again in the next video.